Good afternoon. Thank you for watching this virtual lecture event. For those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security and international affairs. We have five master's degree programs, 18 certificates of study, and a new doctoral program. We also offer the opportunity to take a single course without having to pay an entire semester's worth of tuition costs. One can also audit such a course at a much less cost. If you're interested in learning more about us, please visit iwp.edu. This afternoon, we'll be hearing from Dr. Marek Hodakiewicz. Dr. Hodakiewicz holds the Kosciuszko Chair in Polish Studies at the Institute of World Politics and leads IWP Center for Intermarium Studies. At IWP, he also serves as a professor of history and teaches courses on geography and strategy, contemporary politics and diplomacy, Russian politics and foreign policy, and mass murder prevention in failed and failing states. He is the author of Intermarium, The Land Between the Black and Baltic Seas, and numerous other books and articles. He holds a PhD from Columbia University and has previously taught at the University of Virginia and Loyola Marymount University. Dr. Hokevich, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It's business as usual at IWP, and we have another intermarium lecture. Today, we'll talk about revolutionary slaughter and pogroms. First, as usual, uh, opinion of witnesses and uh, historians. Richard Pipes wrote about this particular issue as follows. The Bolsheviks had to spill blood to bind their wavering adherents with a bond of collective guilt. The more innocent victims of the Bolshevik party had on its uh, conscience, the more the Bolshevik rank and file had to realize that there was no retreating, no faltering, no compromising, that they were inextricably bound to their leaders and could only either march with them to total victory regardless of the cost or go down with uh, them in total doom. When a government arrogates to itself the power to kill people, not because of what they had done or even might do, but because their death is needed, we're entering an entirely new moral realm, realm called the Bolshevik Revolution. And here is an eyewitness, Vladimir Pizatonsky, a leading Bolshevik activist in the Ukraine in 1919. We submitted ourselves to elements of the peasantry who, although very much sympathetic to Bolshevism, were nonetheless very suspicious, to say the least, of communism. The peasant partisan enthusiastically interpreted our battle slogans during the period of the overthrow of the old regime and saw us as willing allies in the fight against the landlords. But having won that fight, the partisan wanted one further thing. He wanted rid of everything foreign, truzdoy, and impose, nanosnoy, which means urban so that they might finally be the master of his own land. Previously, the Bolsheviks had said, arm yourself, beat the landlord, and seize his land. The communists now say, give the state your bread, subject yourselves to discipline, give us your weapons. It is no surprise that they turned against us with almost the same ferocity with which they had risen up against the hetman and Petlura. And here is an eyewitness account by El Shapiro from 1918. In the Klinovka station, I was surprised to see a Red Army company composed entirely of Jews, and even including some wearing earlocks. These were yeshiva students from Proskurov who joined the Red Army after Petlura's riots in order to take revenge. Vladimir Korolenko, a progressive writer in Poltava on March 21st, 1919, observed 
a Red Army Jewish soldier from Berdichev ran amok. He would wipe his bayonet in the grass to remove the blood, and with every head he cut, he screamed. This is my payment for my murdered sister. This is my retribution for my murdered mother. The Central Committee of the Policy on Workers of Zion Party in Kiev wrote to Lenin on May 26, 1919. Oh no, uh, I'm sorry, here is the account of, okay, let's start again. So this has to be edited. Zvi Gittelman described a Jewish soldier, a Red Army man, from Berdichev, ran amok. He would wipe his bayonet on the in the grass to remove the blood, and with every head he cut, he screamed, this is my payment for my murdered sister, this is my retribution for my murdered mother. A, a progressive writer, Vladimir Korolenko in Poltava, noted on March 21st, 1919, that there are many people here who want to start bloody pogroms against the Jews. To their credit, the Bolsheviks are decisively against the pogroms, but unfortunately, this is only so because there are so many, there are many Jewish men and women among them. Uh, the Central Committee of the Workers of Zion Policy on Party in Kiev wrote to Lenin on May. 26, 1919, as follows. The formation of special Jewish units, removing the Jewish worker groups from the influence of the Jewish bourgeoisie and its stooges will provide, will promote clarification of the class consciousness of the unfortunate Jewish masses, will strengthen in their milieu the idea of Soviet power and will become a mighty weapon for agitation in the hands of revolutionary parties. The formation of regular red Jewish units, which are the best cadre for the battle against any white guard or pogrom action, would at the same time free the Jewish Red Army man from the oppressive atmosphere of anti-Semitism with which the poorly aware Red Army personnel is imbued. In Brandon Mark Giver wrote that whereas in mid to late 1919, the majority of pogroms were carried out by anti-Bolshevik military forces, in the spring of 1918, anti-Semitic violence flowed principally from Red Guards in the former Pale. The pogroms of the spring of 1918 revealed the extent to which anti-Semitism would articulate with the revolutionary process. In some regions of the former pale, Bolshevik power was actually constituted through anti-Jewish violence. And here is an eyewitness from the Polish army who was taken prisoner by the Bolsheviks, Czesław Żuławski, was incarcerated in a, in a communist uh, camp in Równo, in Volynia, in August and September 1920. I, he says, I uh, became acquainted, acquainted with a uh, few people. Among them, I met a Soviet colonel who spoke Polish well because for many years, he had served in Warsaw as a czarist officer. And he was arrested because when the Soviet 
military took Rovno in July 1920, he did not forbid, according to the accusations of local Jews, robberies by Soviet soldiers. Captain Viktor Jerzykraj Stokalski thus described the fighting in Antonine and Starokonstantinov in Volynia in January and February 1918. Having apprehended or a more serious chat, a few Jewish commissars, we released the rest of that scum who travel on. We took over 500 prisoners uh, among those soldiers. Among them, there were over a dozen Jewish commissars, Jewish Bolshevik commissars, who awaited a uh, special court. Jochen Bohle averred that since Bolshevism in the eyes of the counter-revolutionaries was the result of a Jewish conspiracy, their violent acts were directed first and foremost against Jews. Israel Joshua Singer in the Brothers Askenazi has a very interesting uh, passage segment. By the thousands and tens of thousands, demobilized soldiers of various armies now roam the land. They clung to the sides and tops of trains in an effort to get back to their homes in the Ukraine, in Crimea, Podolia, Volhynia, and White Russia. Eos and confusion reigned among the troops of the shattered Austrian army as the multinational polyglot empire unraveled like a poorly arched garment. The wanton, undisciplined soldiers plundered their military stores, robbed the regimental paymasters, and ran wild through the towns and villages of Poland, killing, raping, plundering. Ethnic and nationalist urges long stifled by the, dominate, by the dominating masters now surfaced. Poles, Czechs, Hungarians, Romanians, Serbs, Croats, Bosnians, Slovenes, and Ruthenians suddenly discovered their national identities. Alsatians replaced German insignia with French. Poles from Austrian occupied regions displayed the Polish eagle and bedazzled the Polish girls. Veterans with revolutionary sympathies affixed red ribbons to their breasts. The only ones with no homeland to return to were the Jews. Hooligans of all persuasions daubed their homes and shops with obscene and threatening slogans. The sounds of nationalistic and the religious songs were accompanied by the tinkle of shattered Jewish window panes. The ones to suffer worst were the Jews of Eastern Galicia. First the Cossacks swept through the area and then the famines and epidemics. The younger Jewish soldiers returning to their homes hint stars of David to their uniforms. Their Gentile comrades jeered them. Why don't you go back to Palestine? Older Jewish veterans were anxious to shed their uniforms and resume their lives. They let their beards and side logs grow and thought about rebuilding their homes, reopening their shops, marrying off single daughters. But the ancient feuds and the rivalries that had ruled the region for centuries had an abated, and each group demanded the Jews total loyalty and obeisance. And finally, a quote from the New York Times, June 27, 1919. Pogrom stories were exaggerated. The revolution in Russia lasted from 1917 to 1991. We are, however, interested here in the initial period between 1917 and 1929, or from the fall of the Tsarist system in February 1917, 
till the victory of the Bolsheviks in the Civil War in March 1921. Originally, Lenin and his comrades believed that they really didn't have stand a chance to maintain themselves in power in Russia without the victory of the Red Revolution in the West. Therefore, first, they awaited it, then they assisted it, and finally, they began pushing east, I mean, pushing west themselves. They were stopped by the Poles in 1920, but they managed to defeat their political opponents on other territories of the uh, Russian, former Russian Empire aflame. They succeeded because they spilled a sea of blood. The whites were neither as ruthless nor as centralized. When I say a revolution in Russia, I mean the chaos, anarchy, slaughter, and the Bolshevik putsch in October 1917, as well as, of course, the, the government of the communists, which succeeded afterwards. This includes the Red Terror and the Civil War. The revolution was not just one event. It was a process. It consisted of various, sometimes se sequential and sometimes simultaneous events. It, they could have either identical or similar reasons. And they could result from a variety of sources, even unrelated ones. They wove themselves into one great tragic and bloody narrative of revolutionary slaughter and pogrom pogroms, as well as convulsions and destruction. This also concerned the eastern borderlands, the intermarium, in particular after the collapse of central powers. Even before then, the Bolsheviks prepared themselves to return to the lands lost as a result of the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. Furthermore, they believed that there would be a world revolution. And because of that, they wanted to link up as soon as possible with that revolution by launching an offensive to the, to the West. From a practical point of view, that meant the necessity to reform the Red Army. Steps were taken, steps were taken uh, seriously towards that end in uh, April 19, in April 1918. The, to, to a large extent, the old army, old military, was dissolved, actually self-dissolved, and then the remnant was essentially let go. The Bolsheviks proclaimed universal draft. They liquidated the custom to elect officers. Ranks were restored. Former officer Officers of the Tsar's army were forcibly induced into the military and commissars were appointed over them. New commanders were treated like hostages, including their families. Any suspicion of treason resulted in an immediate and ruthless execution. 
and anything was considered treason, which did not bring victory to the Reds. So this included not only flight to the whites, but every instance where there was a lack of success or even its delay in achieving. The Bolsheviks considered it a priority to conduct regular operations against various counter-revolutionary forces. The latter were, in the eyes of Lenin and his comrades, not only different Russian anti-Bolshevik orientations, but also the units of national minorities of the former empire, which opposed the communists. Further, the military formations of the Entente, which appeared in insufficient numbers from Vladivostok through Caucasus, Crimea, Ukraine, all the way to Archangel, were considered the enemy. On the territories occupied by the counter-revolutionaries, the Bolsheviks conducted guerrilla struggle, and in cities, they build underground cells, which usually stage uprisings to coincide with uh, regular red offenses. As far as the Bolshevik attitude toward central powers from the military point of view, between March and November 1918, the Bolsheviks exercised utmost neutrality. However, the Kremlin did not eschew revolutionary preparations even on the trains occupied by Germany and Austria. Retreating under the blows of the German offensive in February 1918, the Red Army, the Cheka secret police and the party left their Agentura behind, a net of agents. In the spring and summer of 1918, the Agentura increased its size very dynamically. First, its focus was Eastern Belarus, but soon the nets spread south to Kiev and central Ukraine, and ultimately to Odessa. Meanwhile, the underground Bolshevik net encompassed the entire ter territory of the Oberovs. That means western lands of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. To coordinate secret activities in September 1918, the Kremlin created the Central Bureau of Communist Organizations in the occupied areas. Stanislav Pechkovsky, who was Stalin's deputy, in the Commissariat of Nationalities, became the head of the Central Bureau. His jurisdiction was Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Belarus, Ukraine, and Poland. The strategic aim of the Bureau was to subordinate those countries to Soviet Russia. Next, uh, 
the functions of this particular administrative unit were taken over by the Comintern, the Communist International, starting in March 1919. Meanwhile, the secret and open operations of the Central Bureau remained one of the main engines unleashed from above to seed and prepare the revolution and its violence in the intermarium. The process of gradually increasing the level of violence intensified at the moment when central powers lost the First World War, signing the armistice in the West on November 11th, 1918. From the end of 1918, German and also Hungarian militaries evacuated westwards. A vacuum ensued, which was soon filled with murder, robberies, rape, and arson. This additionally exacerbated the mechanisms of anarchy in the intermarium. The further east, the greater chaos and violence. The grassroots terror below of anarchy simmered constantly and blew up psychically in to greater or lesser orgies of slaughter, slaughter and robbery. Wherever the Bolsheviks appear, there would arrive a powerful wave of red terror from above. All opponents were ruthlessly shot. So-called class enemy, even children, were consigned to slave labor. Soon, the forced obligation of state labor or slave labor for the Bolsheviks became a ubiquitous Soviet reality. The political line which propelled these excesses was the so-called war communism. This was truly the first, although the first failed, attempt to introduce the communist paradise on earth in Russia. Its basis was the joining of the Red Terror with a ruthless exploitation of cities and villages, in particular, the confiscation of foodstuff from the peasants. In addition, there was the conscious inflationary activity of the Red Government. Comrade Grigory Pyatakov called for printing houses to be utilized like a machine gun, printing rubble, uh, rubles um, without any consideration, mass printing of the ruble, of the currency. This was supposed to lead to the disappearance of money as a sign of the dawn of communism. This particular policy ruined everyone except the leaders of the revolution who prospered on human misery. Money became worthless. Richard Hypes calculated that between January 1st, 1917 and January 1st, 1923, the prices increased 100 million times. 
prices increased 100 million times. As a result of all this, general hunger set in. Food was rationed, as well as all other materials. People who were not officially employed had a huge problem surviving because they did not receive food coupons. The Reds liquidated not only all private property, in particular enterprises and factories and so forth, but they also destroyed all charitable institutions. Naturally, the, so there was no relief for, every, for anyone. There was no relief. Naturally, the reaction, the reaction to persecution and attempts to exterminate by uh, confiscating food was Counterviolence. Because in the cities there was uh, there was some distribution by the communist regime of food and other products for free, and also because the communists liquidated rents and other obligatory payments the proletariat of the cities was pacified and the strikes were increasingly less frequent. The terror in the city had a different character than in the village. In the, in the first place, it was directed selectively against the so-called former people and lichens. That means people stripped of the rights. I'm talking about the former elites, including the nobility, um, official dom, entrepreneurs, and intelligentsia. Those victims didn't really resist with arms and hands. The outbreak of anti-Bolshevik violence concerned mostly the village. The resistance against the Bolsheviks derived there also from the fact that a, uh, an average peasant received or took, but it was considered received from the Reds, less than half a hectare, so less than an acre of land. And now the regime threatened him with the confiscation of even this pittance of land. The Reds took hostages and shot him. As a rule, in the spring, summer, and Autumn 1918, the Red Army embarked on an open war against the peasants of the Russian Empire. Let's stress, a party which represented fewer than 1% of the population of the disintegrating empire attacked 90% of the people because that's how many peasants there were. Red violence informed not only social relations, but also political activities. Paced by death by starvation, a consensus of counter-revolution emerged. Naturally, it sported several faces in various parts and um, localities of the empire. And unfortunately, 
there was never an all Russian national unification of counter revolutionary attitudes, social and political attitudes in Russia. What we witnessed was an extreme decentralization of various manifestations of anti-Bolshevik efforts, including armed ones. Warlords of various backgrounds appeared in, in uh, the cities and little towns. Some of them controlled entire chunks of the empire, even entire former gubernias. Whites, reds, blacks, and greens fought among themselves and with each other, giving no respite and no mercy. The Russian political scene became a Gordian knot of tactical alliances dictated by current threats rather than strategic thinking. The blacks were the anarchists, the greens were agrarian populists, and the whites meant monarchists. However, to make this whole picture even more uh, complicated, many of the so-called whites were not really supporters of the czar. Even if uh, they were liberal cadets. They could be simply non-Bolshevik Reds. For instance, socialist revolutionaries. This happened because the communists considered all their enemies as whites. And communist propaganda instilled in scholarship, this false nomenclature. In addition to Russian revolutionaries and counter-revolutionaries, various ethno-cultural groups created their own armed formations. For instance, the Cossacks or the Chechens. Adding to universal chaos, even those forces divided themselves into reds and whites or greens, those national forces. Despite that, in the universal sea of Russian anarchy, uh, discipline unit, however, consisting of ethnic minorities would play a decisive role and could even endeavor and sometimes succeed to turn the tables in a particular front of the civil war. This, for instance, was the case with the Czech Legion, which carried out the orders of the Entente in Siberia, or the Latvian riflemen who went over to the Bolshevik side and became the spinal cord of the secret police, the Cheka. In this manner, an unbelievable number of so-called volunteer armies appeared on the scene. Among them, in the Intermarium, the most distinguished was arguably the German Freikorps and the Polish army units, as well as monarchist Russians, or at least non-Bolshevik Russians. Next to them, there was an array of different former POWs or demobilized soldiers who attempted to return home 
to capture fame and fortune and to overthrow the Reds or anybody, anybody in power in a given neighborhood. And oftentimes, all those forces were quite eager to rob everyone. Everyone killed without mercy his political opponents or people who were considered as such. Class struggle overlapped with ethnic struggle. Landed nobility and Jews earned the dubious distinction of being enemies of virtually everyone. Landed nobility of all ethnicities constituted a very narrow, very narrow sliver of the population. They were in the intermarium mostly of Polish and Russian origin, and their extermination fulfilled itself almost completely. One can guess that in the intermarium, over 10,000 of them, including their families and domestics, died in the slaughter. A leftist historian observed rather laconically as far as this uh, slaughter of the old elites of the nobility is concerned. In fact, the civil war in the countryside began before the Bolshevik Revolution. In spring 1917, in Bielorussia and Volhynia, armed peasants rejected all authority and divided land among themselves. The return of many soldiers, radicalized by the years of fighting, imported violence and social revolution into the countryside. In Volhynia and Belarus, bands of armed peasants attacked German garrisons, burned Polish estates, and also refused to recognize the Bolshevik commissars sent to head the resistance. It was an agrarian rebellion against any authority rooted in Russia's social and political structure. As the traditional life pattern in the village collapsed under the revolutionary wave, it was replaced by radicalism disseminated by soldiers who became the natural leaders of peasant communities. For centuries, fatalistically, having accepted their oppressed status, peasants now compensated themselves in a bloody insurgency directed against everybody, including the Polish landlords, the Germans, the Ukrainian nationalist forces, and the Soviet troops. Violence became a decisive mechanism to protect the villages and a psychological device to overcome the continuous state of uncertainty. Initially, the anarchy uh, concerned the least, the territories under the German occupation, even though, even there, security conditions worsened gradually, deteriorated gradually. Following the retreat of the armies of the Second Reich, violence engulfed most of those lands. This concerned the Jewish population in particular. The peasantry apparently surmised that the attack on the Jewish people was a mechanism of defense of the villages against a, a urban dwellers who persecuted the peasants and especially against the innkeeper, the uh, leaseholder, the moneylender and others, the majority of them Jewish, who blamed who, uh, uh, who were blamed by the peasants, just like the lords and other bloodsuckers, for hundreds of years of persecution and uh, exploitation. Naturally, this was only a psychological excuse. Bestial scum had nothing against enriching itself by robbing 
its victims, deserters and other soldiers in addition to various activities stemming from their plebeian origin attacked every week person, including the Jewish people. Almost always, the violence was from below. It was not organized by the state. Most of the attacks, most of them were, most of them was, were initiated by local bands. There is only one exception from this general rule. In the lower depth, the people were hungry to embrace propaganda that was created from above, the propaganda of the revolutionary class struggle, which was authored by the leaders and intellectuals of leftist parties, social democratic, socialist, social populist, anar anarchist, and so forth. There was no central coordination. There was just a message of hate. The spirit was the same. They simply sang the same murderous melody after the Bolshevik coup d'etat Lenin and his comrades continued to promote the speech of hatred from above by the means of the state, which they began to control. They were assisted in this by masses of socialists and anarchists who joined the Bolsheviks, or at least tactically subordinated themselves to to them, assisting the revolution within Soviet party and state institutions or outside of them or without. For the victims of class struggle, it didn't matter. This was so, this was more so that the state Bolshevik propaganda calling for the murder of lords and bourgeois, constantly could count on nice reception in the lower depth. Whereas only few Jews qualified as lords, so landed, uh, landowners, but most of the Jewish population was classified as bourgeois, whether small, petit bourgeois or not, but they were always considered class enemies. In addition to this, they also fulfilled the function of traditional enemies of the people, of the popular layer of the society. In the Ukraine, according to some statistics, a, after the local bands, next in line as far as the greatest number of anti-Jewish pogroms, 40%, the guilty party were the units of the Ukrainian People's Republic. We must remember that it would be very hard to consider them a classic, classic military. The units of the Ukrainian uh, uh, People's Republic were an assembly of loose, undisciplined groups neither listening to their officers too much, nor the orders from Kiev. 
they mostly paid attention to their warlord, Atama. The volunteer army of the white Russians was supposed to be responsible for about 17.2% anti-Jewish actions. However, as far as the actual perpetrators, most of them were not volunteer army units, but groups allied to it, which were to a large extent not controlled by it. And most of all, the Terek Cossacks, although the Don Cossacks also participated, participated in such dastardly anti-Jewish deeds. We should note, however, that the Red Army also slaughtered Jews. At least 8.6% of all pogroms should be chalked up to the, the, the Bolshevik Red Army. Brendan McGeever believes that in absolute numbers, 430 pogroms were supposed to have been perpetrated by bandits. 171 white Russian Denikinists, 129 Ukrainian popular Petluryovce, 45 the Polish military, and 44 uh, Balahovce, the followers of General Balak Balahovic. Nahum Gergel calculated that between 1918 and 1921, in the Ukraine, 31,071 Jews lost their lives. Most of them, 16,706, perished at the hands of the Petlura um, units. 5,235 Denikin units. 3,271 Grigoryevtsi units who were allied to the Bolsheviks, agrarian anarchists. 725 Red Army units, 149 by the Balahov units, and 134 or 0.4% by the Polish army. 4,615 Jewish victims fell at the hands of unknown bands and so-called insurgents. Jerzy Bozenski, basing himself on the calculations and statistics of Henry Abramson, argues that, that when we take over 31,000 Jewish victims in the Ukraine, the Poles are responsible for 132 Jews killed during 32 pogroms. There are still no comprehensive statistical studies, but one can assume that as far as Jewish victims of who perish at the Polish hands on all fronts and all territories, including Central and Western Poland, as well as the borderlands, a minimum 400 Jews perished under various circumstances between November 1918 and November 1920. However, in my opinion, greatly underestimating the numbers, Bozhensky claims that only in the Ukraine, the Red Army killed 725 Jews in 106 pogroms. We can estimate, however, that the Red Army, the Red Army must have been 
responsible for at least 200 pogroms or maybe more, because under the rubric of bandits, there also must have been uh, Red Army men. In addition, various units temporarily serving in the Red Army also committed anti uh, acts of anti-Jewish violence, for instance, the Grigoryevsi. In this manner, we can calculate that from the hands of pro-Soviet soldiers and so-called partisans, there perished between 10 and 20,000 Jews between 1917 and 1921. This topic is generally neglected or tends to be neglected by historians. So we should present a few examples of anti-Jewish <laughs> violence from the side of pro-communist uh, forces. According to Brendan McGeever, between May, between March and May 1918, in the towns and cities of the Chernihiv region, volunteered Red Guards and sailors attacked Jews in the same moment they marched under the, uh, the red flag. In these regions, the class struggle was overdetermined by anti-Semitism such that the Jew, the Jew became a principal signifier of anti-bourgeois sentiment. Such sentiment was by no means confined to the northeast of Ukraine in Yekaterinoslav. Uh, the defense of the revolution and the fight against the bourgeoisie became inseparable from anti-Semitic violence among some sections of the population. In late March, local Bolsheviks joined Red Guards, members of the local revolutionary committee, Revcom, the local Soviet government, and a group of anarchists in attacking all Jewish self-defense units in the city. Red Guards were heard shouting, Yeeds and counter-revolutionaries. One of the most brutal incidents took place at the end of March in Novhorod Sivierski, a mid-sized city in the Chernihiv province. A large group of Bolsheviks was returning to the city, having been agitating among the peasants to slaughter the Yids, Rezhitsi Zhido. When the Bolsheviks entered the city the same evening, April 6th, a large pogrom broke out in which at least 88 Jews were killed and 11 injured. Such atrocities reoccurred cyclically everywhere in the Ukrainian lands and in, uh, in some localities of White Ruthenia. On March 7th, 1918, the Red Army launched a pogrom in Hluchiv near Chernihiv, under marching under the slogan of eliminate bourgeoisie and hikes. Uh, the next two days saw Jews slaughtered. They would be taken out as entire families and shot. A minimum of, one, of 100 people perished. This is how the Soviet power was established in that, in that particular city. In May, in Chernihu, Bolshevik armies retreating under the pressure from the whites embarked to, I guess, to cheer themselves up on a pogrom of, of Jews at the railway station of Zernovo. 20 people were killed, 19 wounded. Following uh, the defeat of the military of the Ukrainian People's Republic in Human on March 11, 1919, the units of the Red Army, the 8th Regiment, carried out the pogrom of, the pogrom of local Jews. This took place with the assistance of the local Soviet, which was controlled by leftist socialist revolutionaries, who undertook an anti-Jewish purge in uh, the revolutionary authorities, and they accused Bolshevik kikes of closing 
the, uh, mono, uh, the, 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 the term Orthodox Church. In the middle of April, in reaction to uh, a dichotomy, uh, in reaction to um, in propaganda, red propaganda about the dichotomy between workers and capitalists, the Red Army Man of the 6th Regiment staged a pogrom of Jews in Vasilki. The Bogunski Regiment of the Red Army started anti-Jewish pogroms in the Ukraine already in February 1919. On May the 12th, in Zowontoszcza, near Poltava, that regiment joined the rebels of the Red Army, a unit of Hamandzir Nikifor Grigorye. Together, they uh, conducted a pogrom under the slogan, down with the Jewish government. After the pogrom, the Boguinsky regiment, the men, explained that they joined the Grigoryevtsi because they mean the Soviet power, and they also beat the kikes and communists. At this very same time, the Grigoryevsi and local representatives of the Soviet power carried out a pogrom in Human between the, the 12th and 22nd of May, 1918. Over 300 Jews were killed. Between 16th and 21st of May in Cherkasy on the Dnieper, the Grigoryevsi, with the blessing and assistance of local Bolsheviks, factory Bolsheviks, so proletarians, carried out an anti-Jewish pogrom attacking the so-called Jewish speculators. At the same time, the pogromists uh, executed people who defended their affiliation with the Moscow communist government, and most of those were Jews. The struggle against the bourgeois, the Jews, and communists appeared to be one and the same. First, up to 200 people of Jewish self-defense were killed, as well as revolutionary fighting, Jewish fighting groups, but then at least 407 other victims were murdered. The aggressors were united in their struggle against communist kikes. When Trotsky dispatched against the rebels, the first Red Cossack regiment, it attacked on the way to the battlefield the units of the Cheka. One can assume that this was because they were considered Jewish. And the same first Red Cossack regiment of Trotsky organized a, an anti-Jewish pogrom in Lubno. The Red Cossacks yelled, death to the kikes and communists. This was an elite Bolshevik unit. Meanwhile, a division of Bolshevik sailors expedited from Odessa against the rebels, mostly joined the, uh, 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 the rebel regiments. And on May the 15th, it participated in, uh, with them in, in a, a, a pogrom and, uh, in Yelizavetgrad, uh, where at least 1,526 Jews perished. Generally, during 18 days in May 1919, the units stemming from the Red Army conducted 52 pogroms, murdering at least 3,000 
400 Jews. And the Jewish population, as Henry Abramson aptly put it, simply was praying for any government that would save it from the pogroms. The Jews constituted at least 2 million human beings in the intermarium. Percentage wise, we can speculate that more London nobility died than Jews. But in absolute numbers, the Jewish community sustained the most victims. In a universal orgy of killing, the natural exception that occurred consisted of the whites and the Poles because they were interested in restoring law and order and saving the old elite. Those counter-revolutionaries protected the landed nobility as well as uh, the middle classes, including non-red intelligentsia and to a certain extent Jews. Despite that, horrible pogroms, which resulted from between 50,000 uh, 50, to 100,000 Jewish deaths, characterize almost all revolutionary and counter-revolutionary military activity, activities. This paradox stemmed also from the fact that the white army were so tiny that the more territory they captured, the less they were able to secure the life and health of the inhabitants. And in particular, the whites from the volunteer army were incapable of controlling their tactical allies. In particular, the many Cossack formations whose main propeller was robbery. This does not deny the existence of anti-Semitism, but this was not the main determinant of those anti-Jewish attacks. <clears throat> the pogroms stemmed mainly from the dynamics of the revolution and counter-revolution. First and foremost, they were informed by the breakdown of law and order. Generally, all fighting sides lacked in logistics and supplies. If they wanted to live, they had to capture food. And that included requisitions and robbery. The fighters would take food, money, and really anything from anyone. As mentioned, it was the landed nobility that suffered most. And oftentimes they paid with their lives for their origin. That social estate disappeared almost entirely from the provinces of the intermarium. Most frequently, however, the victims of such units and band in the countryside were simply peasants. In cities and little towns, their main aim were the Jewish people. In addition, Jews were urban population, stereotypically considered as rich. They plied a, a trade and, tra uh, and uh, a, they were artisans. So one could expect that they may possess desired products and money. <clears throat> Anti-Semitism infiltrated such perceptions to various degree. But the key factor was that first, anti-Jewishness was a revolutionary expression of class struggle and hatred to bourgeoisie, 
Second, there existed practically no authority capable of protecting the civilian population, including the Jewish people. And even if there functions some embryonic agendas of authority, they were mainly hostile or indifferent. Or they would limit themselves to verbal declarations and to a much, much lesser extent to, uh, to real acts of assistance to the Jewish population. On the other hand, there existed no authority which would, from above, organize, coordinate, and execute murder of Jews. A, a, uh, a great majority, in a great majority of instances of uh, the anti-Jewish violence, we can say that there, that there was, that it generated from below and it was spontaneous, it was not planned from above. Most pogroms were perpetrated by people wearing uniforms and not civilian scums. But uniforms did not translate either into discipline or professionalism in carrying out the acts of anti-Jewish violence. To the contrary, unlike what Elisa Ben-Porat and Thomas Chopper think, military men who plied such dastardly trade, anti-Jewish violence, did not come from disciplined and very well-trained units. This was first and foremost the case of degenerate and the re revolutionary military bands and irregular units fighting under the warlords, in particular in the Ukraine. Very few formations maintain discipline at a high level to match the Polish army. And also, therefore, related to it is the fact that the participation of the Poles in anti-Jewish excesses was relatively negligible. Similar mechanisms concern also Bolshevik pogroms where the Red Army suffered of the lack of discipline and suffered of the cult of the Marxist class struggle. According to a Western uh, historian of great importance, it is often assumed that the Red Army was the only savior of the Jews in the Civil War. In the spring of 1918, however, when Bolsheviks arrived in various towns and cities of the former Pale, a mass exodus of Jews would often take place out of fear that Soviet power would be secured through yet more pogromist violence. Whereas in 1919, Jews and Bolsheviks would often flee Ukrainian cities together when the whites arrived, between March and May 1918, Jews often found themselves running from Bolshevik power. The Bolshevik regime not only robbed, just like the rest of the uh, uh, lower depth scum and others, and even murdered Jews. In addition, the Bolshevik power introduced in life its utopian systemic solution. According to the recollections of David Abramovich of Bitten, to the south of Swanim and Baranovich, 
as far as the lands of white Ruthenia were concerned, where uh, 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 where the Soviets were greeted as the liberators from uh, Polish control. But first, the Red Army, when it came in, emptied all the stores. The Soviet authority then shut down all cultural institutions, people's banks, and even charitable societies. That is a Jewish recollection of a non-Bolshevik Jew. In, in the light of all this, we can see that the pogroms were completely ephemeric in relation to the main uh, political aims of the fighting authorities. Nobody considered his main aim the extermination of the Jewish people. The Bolsheviks wanted a revolutionary tyranny. The whites were fighting for uh, an entire spectrum of ideals from imperial restoration to uh, parliamentary democracy. Captive nations wanted freedom, and Jews endeavored to survive, first of all, in certain places and at certain times, accommodating the crazy developments, insane run of history acceleration of history. At times, their political organizations endeavored to maintain neutrality and at the same time functioning in congruence with the emerging power centers, in particular those which respected law and first and foremost, those that promised a Jewish uh, autonomy. For example, the Ukrainian government in Eastern Galicia. Optimally, if a chance arose, the Jewish society would like the most far-reaching autonomy, both personal and national. Its form was not yet properly elucidated, but it was emerging from a fluid and elastic situation of war and revolution. So it's logical that various parties and milieus of the Jewish community under the stress of the situation and influence of their doctrines would endow the idea of autonomy with various faces. Generally, the organized Jewish society with uh, centrist Zionists in the leadership who uh, competed with religious Jews preferred as partners less culturally developed ethnic groups such as Ukrainians or Poles. The Jewish community could not count on any dramatic concessions with the culturally advanced Poles. So the Jewish community generally was afraid of the Poles. As euphemistically uh, uh, Alexander V. Prusin put it, in this constantly changing kale kaleidoscope of the dialectics of power, the, by the end of the First World War, many Jews regarded Poland's independence as the least desirable solution. If that was actually so, then we can extrapolate that the decisive part of leaderships of various options of the Jewish society preferred to remain under Germany or Russia and its revolutionary milieus, even under the Soviets, rather than exist within Poland. Another option out there was the Jewish uh, support for Lithuania or Ukraine. 
therefore, the Jewish community or some in the Jewish community cooperated more eagerly with those folk nationalisms rather than engage on the Jewish side in the steps to restore Poland. This is not a topic that has been researched exhaustively, but we uh, have seen evidence from Białystok, uh, Wielkopolska, Górnośląsk, and Galicja to that effect. Thus, we can suggest that in central Poland, in particular in the lands of the Kingdom of Poland and in Western Galicia, around Krakow, Jewish parties and organizations were the most open to coexistence, cooperation uh, with the Polish state. However, on, in the Rimlands, the borderlands of the Commonwealth, Polish Commonwealth, various leadership groups of the Jewish community preferred the non-Polish solution, deluding themselves that in a different state organism that they would prosper much better. They already were familiar with the imperial concept. Therefore, it suited them to remain in either the German or the Russian system rather than enter the pro-Polish solution. It was similar with uh, folk nationalisms, which appeared to be immature and therefore bringing hope to the possibility of a better deal with the Jewish community, including a very far reaching autonomous solution, perhaps even a form of a condominium of sovereign uh, parts of citizens organized in congruence with separate but equal ethnocultural structures, Ukrainian, Belarusian, or Jewish. Naturally, none of those models agreed with the postulates of Jewish revolutionaries, in particular the pro-Bolshevik ones, and none of the paradigms, in particular the pro-communist one, had no chance to emerge successfully in the framework of independent Poland. Polish nationalism was, was mature. It stemmed from the Piast period and it was based on the Jagiellonian paradigm. The Poles were open to Jewish, to Jewish assimilators. They were ready to give rights to individual Jews. They agreed to grant rights to all minorities. They agreed to religious freedom for everyone, including the adherents of Judaism. Uh, of Judaism. They never opposed the existence of private and community Jewish schools, as well as very many other cultural, social, and charitable institutions of that minority. But the Poles excluded the possibility of their existence as separate state entities within the Polish Republic. The Poles absolutely opposed the postulates of autonomy of the Jewish community as a separate state entity. They simply did not agree to the creation of a condominium which the Polish press described as Judeo-Polonia. Prusin and others agree with such extrapolations. Let us stress that various 
Jewish orientations were concerned about anti-Jewish violence, but that in Poland was relatively mild. Same, same, this concerns so-called Polish anti-Semitism, which in comparison with its other manifestations among the, the neighbors, looked like a mild affliction. The fundamental issue here was to recognize Jews as a nation with all, uh, all implications and rights. During World War I and during the revolution, the Jews were recognized as a national minority, not only religious and, or cultural, but national minority, a separate nation in sequence. First, the Germans in the Oberos, then the uh, Russian, Provisional government in Petersburg, and next the Ukrainian Rada in Kiev. Only Poland refrained from this gesture for a variety of reasons, in particular because the paradigm of Jewish popular nationalism, just like other folk nationalisms, was not compatible with the ideal of the resurrected old uh, uh, Polish Commonwealth. Further, Poland for a long time could not recognize anything or anyone because technically, uh, as far as the creation of a sovereign state, we can only talk from November 11th, 1918. And then Poland didn't want a state within a state. This, to a great extent, implicated the uh, Polish-Jewish relations. Finally, let us realize that among Jews themselves functioned, functioned one more, the most important element. This, is, this was the instinct for self-preservation. In the course of the civil war, the Jewish community caught in the red-white conflict increasingly sided with the communist regime. This, however, it did not from preference, but from the instinct of self-preservation. When the white armies entered the Ukraine, in the summer of 1919, Jews welcomed them, for they had suffered grievously under the Bolshevik rule. If not as Jews, then as bourgeois, they quickly became disenchanted with white policies that tolerated pogroms and excluded Jews from the administration. After experiencing white rule, Ukrainian Jewry turned anti-white and looked to the Red Army for protection. Thus, a vicious circle was set in motion Jews were accused of being pro-Bolshevik pro -Bolshevik and persecuted, which had the effect of turning them pro-Bolshevik for the sake of survival. This shift of allegiance served to justify further persecution. This mechanism in, in a much milder form also functioned on the axis of relations between Jews and Poles. The situation remained, however, potentially explosive because in very many places there arose Jewish party militias, militias, mainly stemming from revolutionary options, but also various Jewish self-defense units, which in particular in the Intermarium had a tendency to ally themselves with extreme forces, including the Bolsheviks against the so-called reactionaries or white poles between 1919 and 1920. As Elisa Ben-Porad and 
Andrew Sloan claim this was the case with the Minsk region. Such contentions are generally verified by Oleg Budnitsky, Arkady Zeltser, and Jonathan Dekel Chen. They stress a continuity of this phenomenon in the Minsk region, also after the Polish Bolshevik War. This concerns in particular the development of the situation on, on the Soviet side of the cordon, which was stood in relation to the attempts of the people to uh, accommodate to the Bolshevik power, and that included the Jewish community who wanted to, who found themselves under the Bolshevik system. Thank you very much.